The first monster to be properly fought underwater, the most social leviathan and a reasonable early game creature, Royal Ludroth is a successful inhabitant of the waterways of the Monster Hunter world. Able to tolerate both fresh and salt water, their wide range makes them frequent targets of hunts. But they are best known for the excessive sponge-like manes in the males. What are these for? How do they affect their ecology? And what difference is there between the male and female Ludroth in their behaviour? Obviously, the starting point of any discussion of Royal Ludroth would be its resplendent yellow mane, a big spongy structure known for its elasticity and holding water. In fact, the latter is given as the reason Royal has his mane, to hold water and prevent desiccation. But this explanation doesn't fully hold water itself. The rest of Ludroth seem to be covered in waterproof green scales that limit fluid exchange or the species would struggle to swap between salt and fresh water so easily. And if it was to prevent desiccation, then the smaller female Ludroth should have far more extensive coverings of the sponge tissue due to their greater risk of drying out being smaller. But instead, it's far less prevalent. So it seems like the mane may well have other purposes, and its extreme size in males only does suggest sexual selection as being a likely influencer of this. But what traits is Royal showing off? And what else does it do other than keep things hydrated? And there may well be several reasons that all contribute and filter themselves through much of Royal's ecology. Ludroth presumably still need to breathe air like reptiles and it's unknown if gaseous exchange can occur across the sponge tissue like amphibian skin, so long as it's wet. But if this is the case, then it may well contribute to increasing the endurance of royal individuals, by giving them an additional way to oxygenate their tissues in land or underwater. The bigger the mane, the better you can do this, and males have larger manes to both support their expensive mass, but also show off that they can do so to the females. Another may be somewhat related to the production of dash juice, only produced by mature males, seemingly tied to stamina, and often given as a reward for breaking the mane, it does seem the two may be related. Frivolous as that connection may be, with purple Ludroth it does seem the mane and slash or neck is capable of synthesizing its own proteins. But what does Royal need this stamina boost for? And one answer could be diving. Diving mammals have a number of mechanisms to keep them alive and oxygenated at depth, and one is splenic contraction. In many mammals, the spleen is the creator of, and often a big reservoir for, red blood cells. And when submerging, diving mammals often squeeze its contents out to give more oxygenated red blood cells to help them stay under for longer and recover faster at the end of dives too. So maybe the main for Royal Ludroth fulfills a similar purpose. As well as the potential of gaseous exchange to help out, it holds a reservoir of raw dash juice in its untreated form. I'm assuming at least most consumable monster extracts are partially processed and treated before consumption, and can't just be slurped raw, and pulls this into the body to oxygenate tissues and significantly increase dive times. This process, or this substance, may take a lot of water to create or maintain, and in turn may explain why Royal Ludroth has to hydrate itself and especially restore the shrunken mane when exhausted as its function is applicable in any aerobic activity, and not just diving. Long distance travel and fighting with rival males also counts too, so again, a larger male with greater supplies would mean a greater capacity for enduring tasks, and likely fitter offspring. Faster recovery is also important, as most strenuous tasks can carry risk. As a royal repays its oxygen debt at the surface after a dive, it's very vulnerable to predation, and the quicker it can submerge again, the better. Similarly, having the mane as a reservoir of it may be an alternative to splenic contraction, and it's unknown if dash juice is based off red blood cells or another similar substance. But splenic contraction can only be done for short amounts of time. The process of dumping a lot of red blood cells into your circulatory system causes your blood to become thick and viscous, which isn't what you want your blood to be, and can be dangerous long term. Royal's Mane may provide a safer or more streamlined version of this blood doping. 
But what is Ludroth diving for? And likely food, as revealed when we take a look at the teeth of Ludroth. Much like some extant and extinct fish and rays, they're plate-like, and so are almost certainly designed to crush hard-shelled organisms. Said organisms are most commonly found in the benthos and demersal zones of the sea, so to get their daily bread, both Ludroth are going to have to go diving. Ludroth jaws are reasonably robust, but not quite as overtly specialised as something like those of some ray species, presumably due to having different relative body mass to the thickness of the prey shells they have to crush, and Ludroth having bones that aren't cartilage. But Ludroth still possess the robust, generalised tooth plates to crush and consume tough prey, so it can be assumed their main diet is mollusks and shellfish, though this may be a factor of mainly adult life. Some duraphages only get the sufficient development and bite strength to crush tough foods in adult maturity, and so express ontogenetic niche partitioning between different age classes which is to say that the young can eat different food from the adults. Considering Ludroth don't take care of their young, it can be reasonably assumed that this may be a similar case here. Baby loggerhead turtles live the first stage of their lives out at sea around lines of sargassum, feeding on pieces of seagrass and small marine life until they've grown sufficiently to come to a more coastal lifestyle as durophages. It's unknown if Ludroth have quite a similar lifestyle, but with the smaller clutches and being much larger bodied animals, and so significantly larger on hatching, they may not engage in such extravagant travels. Young may still live in relatively close proximity to the adults, but they likely eat softer bodied prey, possibly things like flatfish and cephalopods around the benthos. For the adults, this all likely means that in areas of overlap, Ludroth are yet another animal that regularly indulges itself in the yearly bounty of hermitors of any ages. With specialist equipment for crushing shells, it could even be possible that adult males are willing to tackle the daimyos when especially hungry, though it does seem adult shoguns are too well armed with their bladed pincers. This is not to say that Ludroth as a species are hugely picky. Preference and adaptations as a durophage doesn't necessarily exclude eating anything else. Females will attack Aptonoth too close to the water's edge, and anything else that falls in too as well as keenly pursuing Epioth with fairly clear intent to hunt. Being a durophage means you're still a predator with a diet of animal protein, and if sufficiently hungry, male or female Ludroth may not be hugely picky about where it comes from. Scavenging other marine life of sufficient size and terrestrial animals at the water's edge may all also suffice in a pinch. The males and females of the species may not also dive in the same way either, and body mass as well as different physiological demands can change that. Royal likely takes full advantage of his greater mass and stamina, and dives far deeper than the females in his harem, and we see something similar in marine iguanas too. Most of the small, subadult or female iguanas feed in the intertidal zone, often only a metre or so beneath the water's surface, or even exposed when at high tide. These areas tend to be overgrazed, and so small animals get less food and less food per bite too. But the largest male iguanas can swim further out to the subtidal zones. Their larger size allows them to conserve body heat better and secure themselves to the rocks easier. It also means they can swim more efficiently, and on the surface they can survey lower areas in the clear waters for good grazing spots before committing to the dive. All in all, the biggest males get the subtidal zones to themselves to reap rich rewards from. So Ludroth may use these same tactics. While it's not quite as strict as suburban intertidal zones due to female Ludroth still being the size of an alligator or so, there is still likely significant depth-based partitioning between the sexes with female Ludroth utilising nearshore areas and more shallow water, needing less food for their body mass and being less equipped for deeper dives, as well as poorer suited to colder waters. It's hard to say just how far out royals dive, but considering their size and adaptations, they could be potentially reasonably deep swimmers. Elephant seals are the third deepest diving mammals after Cuvia's beaked whales and sperm whales, and are the smallest of the trio by far but still manage depths deeper than the rest of the great whales. They also show similar differences between the sexes with their foraging, and between species, 
With southern elephant seals, the males dive deeper, and the females do the more pelagic or open water foraging. Whereas in northerns, the females dive deeper, and the males dive to shallow shelf habitats. In the latter, it's to do with risk and reward. Males gain mass six times as fast as females, and gain energy at four times the rate, but are also six times more likely to die, and this is likely due to predation. Ludroth of any sex experience considerable risk, both are vulnerable in open surface water to aerial predators like elders or flying wyverns, and at deeper depths from oceanic predators like Lagaicrus or Plesioth. Even Akarkos actually seems to be a mainly shallow water forager that would readily consume either of them. So the difference between male and female diving would likely be due to physiology over behaviour. When it comes to very deep diving, physiologically there's not much to say Royal couldn't pull it off. But the main two questions I'd have would be senses and body heat. Ludroth have reasonably large eyes, and so maybe visual foragers, which isn't common but also isn't unheard of for marine durophages, but they could also be for general vision and seeing threats over foraging too. Crocodiles have sensory organs in the skin around their jaws that allows them to detect pH, temperature and pressure. And so Ludroth may have similarly sensitive skin around its mouth. In low visibility water or night dives, it may snuffle along the benthos, detecting shellfish and mollusks by touch. This would be somewhat similar to a walrus, who rest their heads on the sea floor facing the current, rootling like a boar as they go along the seabed to uncover bivalves, or using their flippers to either waft away the sediment cloud or scrape the substrate away. Sometimes they may even use a water jet to blast away sediment, so Ludroth's spitball could potentially have some foraging use as well. They detect their food with both sight and touch, and efficiently forage for enough small food items to sustain their bulk. So clearly a big animal can make a good living off eating small shellfish. It's unknown if Ludroth's mane plays some role in assisting diving too on a physical level. Once you reach a certain depth, you achieve negative buoyancy, which is the technical term for sinking. Animals use this when diving to save energy, and what tissues you're made of can affect when you achieve negative buoyancy. If the sponge mane is equal or denser than water when saturated, it may serve as an anchor helping royals sink to the benthos and keeping them there against currents and eddies. If not, it may help advertise fitness in royals that so they have to overcome the buoyancy of their large mane to forage. So royals may be something of an underwater generalist durophage, not quite as purely specialised for certain substrates or feeding strategies as various real-life animals, but better suited for a wide range of prey. Their forelimbs are described as better at grasping terrain than for combat, and so Ludroth can either anchor itself to tied battered rocks to graze on muscle beds, scraping them free from the rocks with its teeth plates, or it can dig and rootle among siltier waters like a walrus, or pursue large individual prey items like crabs and other crustaceans like a ray or loggerhead. Overall, small wonder for their success as one of the most widespread and likely the most numerous leviathan in the world of Monster Hunter. As such, Ludroth can be seen in both fresh and saltwater habitats, and can be seen to engage in the interesting behaviour of preferentially bathing in running streams, despite literally being an aquatic animal anyway. And could this stereotyped behaviour be perhaps explained by its distribution? Such astute grooming is seen in some aquatic animals, and chiefly when they swap between different bodies of water. Eurasian otters are often at their highest densities in coastal areas, despite being viewed as freshwater mammals mainly. But in saltwater habitats, they do still require some fresh water. After swimming in the sea, they have to bathe in fresh water to rinse out their coat, or the salt causes their fur to clump up to not dry properly and to lose a lot of both its warming and waterproofing abilities. And they do have some awareness of this. An otter prevented from washing after a dip in salt water will become very stressed, until it can clean itself off. So maybe Ludroth has something similar, and that their skin is mostly fine, but with the royals, with their manes, they have to or prefer to rinse them after dips in salt water to clean them out. 
and allow them to function at maximum capacity. After all, if the main has some role in hydration and preventing desiccation, then getting rid of any salt crystals before it dries out should be a pretty high priority. This in turn may limit the distribution of royals compared to normal ludroth. If the males require fresh water to bathe in after saltwater dips, then this prevents them fully colonising areas of well-drained or arid coastline without flowing or standing water. Indeed, with otters, they live at far lower densities or outright avoid areas with unfavourable hydrology for bathing. It could be worth noting female ludroth can still live in such areas, and males may undertake considerable pilgrimages to mate with them in the appropriate season, even if they can't stay permanently in the area. Considerable colonies of unattended females may live the bachelorette lifestyle unharassed for much of the year, and be a case of small monsters having a reason for their large males not being present. This could be true of other types of water too, and if overly stagnant or eutrophicated, royals may well prefer to rinse off in flowing water to avoid skin parasites, algae, or other unwanted visitors, which could explain the preferential bathing in areas like the flooded forest, too. Like many leviathans, retaining features of a terrestrial lifestyle are still important to Ludroth. Coming out onto land is a necessity in the tree-choked channels of river rainforests, like those of the flooded forest as well as moving to higher elevations to reach areas further upstream. Ludroth ecology likely changes accordingly in such inland habitats, as compared to their coastal kin, with territorially defended stretches of river replacing defended stretches of coastline, and depth-based habitat partitioning is likely replaced with the portion of the river preferred by the different sexes. As with other species of aquatic predator, Royals likely prefer deeper main stem or parent rivers, and female Ludroth prefer the more shallow tributaries and deltas, both for feeding and ease of movement, with the large males likely struggling in some of the more shallow and cluttered streams. Diet may be the biggest change, and Ludroth may be more typically predatory in the forest rivers, with overall fewer and less widespread freshwater crabs or other large crustaceans, other than hermitors. River Ludroth may take more fish and game than shellfish. Bottom feeding likely still occurs, albeit for eels, rays, and loach-like fish. And Ludroth may still use their teeth plates to crunch up armoured catfish, or similar species, all found when rootling on the riverbed. Epioth are likely taken more frequently, as are young slagtoth and small bird wyverns. Much like crocodiles coming out onto land to try and pirate the kills of other predators, Ludroth may well attempt to appropriate the kills of Great Roggy, or other small predators if made in the vicinity of the water's edge. Similarly, in regards to other predators, inland female Ludroth may enjoy longer and safer lives than their coastal counterparts. Murky water and a dense canopy of trees provide good cover from the few volant predators that make such densely forested areas their main home and assuming they choose the shallower tributaries and streams, they're likely a lot safer from large predators swimming up the main stem of the river, like Lagiacrus and Plesioth, both capable of taking even the largest royal male, who, as said, likely have to accept such risk in pursuit of maintaining their bulk. The predator that may pose the biggest problem is Gobel. Not only is Gobel large enough to easily consume female Ludroth, and quite potentially a small royal too, but it also lies directly in wait for the foraging Ludroth. The bottom feeding behaviour makes encounters very likely, and Gobel may be the most significant inland predator of females at least. There may be some adaptations to this, and if rumbled or caught in ambush, Ludroth likely mob Gobel intensively, with large royals attacking directly to drive it away. This may also be the cause of Ludroth caution around fire too. Whilst neither male nor female are especially fond of fire, the notable caution shown by the females to torches may well be an instinctive behavioural response to avoid sources of light other than the sun, so as to avoid the bioluminescent lure of Gobel. In conflict in general, the royal's mane may provide some protection too, being thick, loose and able to absorb a lot of bites and scratches from other animals. 
whilst still allowing the royal to retaliate. Whilst this likely isn't enough to protect fully against aquatic giants like Lagicris and Plesioth, the latter of which may strike the main torso anyway, it likely provides some good cover from lesser foes, and especially other royal Ludroth, much like the thick and loose skin seen in some mammals. Males presumably compete fiercely for harems, and aren't afraid to get physical with one another. And the mane may well be a vital protection for the neck and chest against the claws and teeth plates of an opponent intent on usurping or protecting a harem. In some areas, the protection afforded by the mane may develop even further, and as well as the secretion of dash juice and the holding of water, it can even secrete poison. The unimaginatively titled Purple Ludroth does as such with its signature purple mane, and can also be recognised with its duller scales too. This also further suggests that the mane or adjacent tissue isn't just a literal sponge, and has an active role in producing at least some proteins of its own. The question of why is presumably answered by the habitat of purple Ludroth. Found much more inland than the royals in the Misty Peaks, it can no longer rely on deep water to evade terrestrial threats here. Whilst there are deep lakes and ponds in the peaks, much of the rivers and streams are very shallow, and while still providing fair foraging, their risk is far greater. The same is true of land foraging or travel, which purple Ludroth may have to do a lot more of outside of more typical habitats. Land-bound predators can easily attack in such shallow water bodies, and without an additional form of defence, royal Ludroth may be very vulnerable with no means of escape. Presumably, a royal Ludroth at one point had a mutation that resulted in a toxic or foul-tasting secretion, along with the raw dash juice, and survived well enough in such areas to pass on and derive this adaptation further. Their status of purple female Ludroth is unknown, and it's also doubtful if purple royals are sufficiently diverged and genetically distinct enough to be a true subspecies, but it's not as outlandish as some others. For smaller leviathans like Mizutsune and Ludroth, it does seem that there's a correlation with defensive abilities and increases in usage of terrestrial habitat, with their slow, comparatively cumbersome movements on land still limiting both fighting and fleeing compared to their huge cousins like Lagiacrus and Almadron, smaller leviathans may make up for it with secretions like bubble foam or poison, to protect themselves away from deeper water and safer areas. But new discoveries are always being made, and a more agile and completely terrestrial leviathan may well be found someday. So for my thoughts on Royal Ludroth, solid monster. Good ecology, a refreshing drone monster rather than another sodding raptor, and the whole sponge thing is a quite nice spin on the stamina mechanic. I actually think it would work better with him properly washing it, like the animation in Sunrise, rather than just submerging in any water. Can easily retcon it into him preferring fresh water rather than stagnant or salt water for the future. Royal Ludroth's fight is okay, but it does stagnate quickly in high rank once you've fought Lagiacrus in 3rd gen, and realise how many moves they share. For first timers in Rise, he probably held some originality for longer, with little overlap with the other Leviathans in that game, at the cost of being pretty easy like most of the game and especially the early game content. A combination of greater divergence from Lagiacrus' moves and the return of water combat would make him a pretty solid early game monster in future, and maybe a bump in difficulty too. Whilst the games are getting easier, the early game in particular and especially in Rise is just a meat grinder simulator. A lot of early game monsters can have potential mechanics or implied attributes that are never fully realised in gameplay that could restore some challenge. For example, I think giving Royal Ludroth near unlimited stamina, as implied by his dash juice, could do something to help it claw back some difficulty, and just tie the main washing stamina in for creating water attacks only. Same with Gypsaros's stamina too. Whilst I don't think Ludroth should exactly be a permanent returner, I do believe it has some relevance and history in the series as the first proper underwater hunt. And whilst it shouldn't fulfil that role again, any more than any other starter monster repeating its role, should Underwater return, I do think it deserves to be a regular returner. Despite the coping, I'm far from certain if Underwater will be back in 6, but I generally hope so, and it's one of the few mechanics the developers have actually expressed a real interest in bringing back. 
I think the amounts it adds to the world, map and monsters, are just too great to allow 3rd gen's weak and stilted implementation to hold it back forever. Thanks for watching. And thanks to top patrons Phenomenon and the Super Estupa for their ongoing generosity. As well as Kay Sandum, Big Al, Eringar Steiny, Flygon's Archive, Sassy Birdo, Inventory Overflow, Tristan Berry, Evilly, Howleth, Archazor Queen, Seth Fake Last Name, Zaysa, Karazul, Dodecablos, and Bazugazu Bakuhatsu Bakumatsu for their continuing support in keeping the channel going. If you're interested in doing so too, there's a link to the Patreon in the description, and I appreciate any amount you can give. Thanks as ever to Carmen Rider Moton for creating the digital artwork of Ludra off behaviour, especially the underwater pieces this time around too. For more of her original artwork, links are provided in the description for her assorted social media. Thanks too to I Am The Kaiju King for the Great Ludroth Skull. For more skulls, more artwork and original content, be sure to follow him on Tumblr. And if you can, support his Patreon too. Links to both are provided in the description. From Glavinus's video last time, one question a few had was, what would a female Glavinus look like? And the only brief, scraped information mentions them as having a smaller, duller tail than the males and not much else. We can try to infer a few things though, and females may not need horns or ornamented heads like the males if they're not fighting as much. She likely keeps the heat stacks though for the costs of ovulation, but she may be duller in colour too, perhaps browns and greys over reds and blacks. Some also made the suggestion of green if Glavinus was made to run in parallel to Rathalos. With the blueness of iron, some also pointed out that iron can indeed be blued by various heat treatments or chemical processes, and Glavinus's actions may cause this. This may well be special or treated iron, as a lot of weapons and armour made using normal ore do seem to come out as the more typical metallic grey. For next time, I mentioned a while ago a video was postponed due to title updates, so the next video will indeed be time for 